Welcome to Dumbest in the Room. If you've lived in Hampton Roads for any amount of time in the last 40 years, you know my guest today. He's a local legend, and and um, his name is Don Slater. So, Don, welcome to Dumbest in the Room. Thanks for being here. I'm not local. I'm in Paris. <laughs> I need to have a little beret on and a fake little mustache. I, I put the, I put this up here as and and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of it at the last minute. Uh, so anyway, we're having fun. We're uh, just being in Paris for this thing. Hey, that's cool. Uh, looks like Paris. looks like beautiful weather there. Uh, yeah, um, and, and it isn't here. It'll probably snow uh, during the time that we do this, just a little bit, but it won't stick. So. Oh no! Did you, you like that word snow, or are you one of the people that that? Well. Um, Everybody gets probably a little too excited about it, but but that's all right. It makes me work a lot, and snow is real tough to predict around here. Um, usually, it's real tough to predict around here. If you get that much snow, just a tiny bit of snow, and you're trying to predict that, that can shut us down. Uh, so that, that's really hard to predict that much snow. Uh, this much snow, that's easy to predict to predict and if i'm wrong let's say by two inches it's two inches more two inches less it doesn't matter all that much but uh predicting under two inches of snow is really a tough thing to do or under an inch really so before we get into specifics about weather i read your uh wavy bio and you started at wavy in in uh 1981 so that's 40 years this year yes so that is a long time yeah, it is, uh, but it but it doesn't seem like a long time. I guess when you stretch it out over all the different managements that I've worked for in different you know different uh, situations, uh, yeah, then it is a long time. Um, it's and uh, the evolution of uh, television and television news and the rest of the world and the internet and and everything around it. Uh, there's been a lot of changes with that, so. So before we go any further about that, let's let's talk about your. Uh, how did you get into meteorology, and and where did you go to school for it? And well, I initially got into television uh, right out of college. I was uh, I was in school, and uh, I was invited out to dinner by a by a professor, and there were several other students too. So we were all out to dinner, and one of the people there was a program director for a TV station. And this professor started talking me up to this program director for the TV station. And anyway, um, and these, these other students, they were trying to pitch themselves. And I'm kind of going, eh, not the time or place. But before I knew it, uh, I ended up with a job interview and an audition at the TV station. I worked at that TV station for about a year and a half. That was in Fargo, North Dakota. Mm. Uh, surprisingly a pretty good TV market. Uh, they were do, doing uh, really good TV and I learned a lot there uh, for about a year and a half and then the newsroom kind of blew up there and a friend of mine uh, called me and said, hey, I hear things are kind of blowing up there. I'm working at a station in Nebraska and it's got a, and they've got a really good news director. If you want to come, come down here? I'm sure he'd love to uh, uh, um, he'd love to talk to you. So I talked with him and he, and he hired me. Uh, and I, you know, I just did the interview over the phone and he hired me and I went there and I stayed in Nebraska for four and a half years and was itching to get out of there and just kind of, kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, tired of Nebraska. And, um, and wanted to, to grow and, and, and do other things and uh, see if I could make it in the business. And so uh, finally, I had, a, I had uh, a job opportunity that fell through in Louisville, Kentucky at WAVE, uh, and that fell through. And I was kind of on the string for a job in Sacramento, and, and also I had a, a genuine job offer in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I and I didn't want it, um, and uh, and so I turned that one down, and um, and then uh, I had a job that was kind of on the line 
they hadn't brought me in for an interview yet. That was in Sacramento, California. And that was at the same time that all of a sudden, Bing, please fly in this weekend. Here are your tickets. Uh, your tickets will be waiting for you at the counter. Uh, please fly to Norfolk, Virginia and WAVY TV. So I flew into Norfolk, Virginia in uh, July of 1981. And I flew in and the news director at the time, who was infamous for being really, really cheap, um, and he was, uh, <laughs> I was put up at the, I was put up at a holiday Inn near the airport and it is now a, that holiday Inn is on Northampton Boulevard and there's now a Mongolian buffet there. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think you can figure out which holiday Inn it was. Uh, if you look at it, it's kind of near a Wawa there now and stuff. And anyway, the, uh, really cheap motel near the airport, uh, brought me into the studio, which was at the time a three-story building that used to be a, uh, used to be a farmer's market. It's near uh, where the old city hall and jail uh, is in Portsmouth. The gotcha. building is gone now. Thankfully, it was a three-story <laughs> three building, and uh, the studio was on the third floor, and that's where my office was, too. The weather office was on the third floor. The newsroom was in the bottom floor. It flooded. Mm. Uh, it flooded very often. The newsroom did, uh, yeah. both from uh, sewer problems and also from uh, storm problems. So oftentimes the newsroom would have to evacuate and, you know, and, and move to other parts of the building. Wow. And I was on the third floor. And that's where the studio was. And this and the building, when a when a bus would go by, the building would kind of would kind of sway back and forth a little bit, so that we had these big lights in the studio. These big lights would kind of would kind of sway Jeez. back and forth when a bus would go by. So it was kind of a crazy uh, crazy place to have a studio. And I worked there. And Terry Zahn, which some people may remember, uh, he was hired a week before me. And uh, they had brought in all these new people, uh, and they're attempting to make a go of it. It was a station that had not done well at all. Uh, WTKR was, had been king of the hill for a very, very long time. Uh, WVEC was doing okay against uh, WTKR, and we were an upstart. They brought in a guy named, well, they brought in Terry Zahn to do weekends. Uh, they had a guy named Bob Grip who was doing weekend anchoring and Diana Morgan and Bruce Rader was already there and a number of good reporters. They brought in some really, really top notch reporters uh, and uh, and uh, and we made a go of it. And WTKR stumbled. They decided that they wanted to fire some people and. Uh, some on-air people and did so badly and uh, went through a big PR problem and mm. we rose to the top and we've pretty much been there uh, ever since. Started from the bottom, now you're here. Uh, yeah, yeah. And in that time, too, I, I uh, kind of looked around at other jobs, too, other places after I'd been here for a while. Um, I was offered a job with a place called Satellite News Channel, um, there were two. I had uh, contracted with a with a uh, an agent, uh, NS Beanstalk in uh, New York, and uh, they'd taken me on uh, that agency. And it was before my contract was up at Wavy, so they were kind of looking to rehire me, and and uh, but I was kind of looking to get out, and and I turned down the job at Satellite News Channel. It was a it was a uh, it was a joint effort between ABC and Westinghouse at the time. And uh, CNN was the only game in town as far as, as, far as uh, doing 24-hour news. So they wanted to take on CNN. And so they offered me a job. Something about it just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And I hemmed and hawed and didn't get back to them right away. Uh, 
uh, because I also had a job on, a, on the line, which I didn't get. And that was a WABC in New York for a weekend meteorologist. And I really wanted that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, anyway, while I waited for WABC to make up their mind and kept satellite news channel on, on kind of a on hold, right. uh, satellite news channel folded. Uh, so thank God I didn't take that job yeah. or I would have been stuck with a job that was not existing. Uh, they got bought out by uh, Ted Turner at the time, who just bought them to kill them. Wow! Uh, they they pulled up they uh, pulled some of the talent and some of the equipment uh, from a satellite news channel, which was in Stamford, Connecticut, uh, basically suburban New York, uh, and so. I ended up at Wavy and had two kids, and that was that. Yeah. Let's, let's go back to the beginning. When, when you were a kid, were you wanting to be a meteorologist, or you just happened to be at that dinner? and Kind of both. When I was a kid, I used to, I used to watch this news guy, or this weather guy. Uh, his name was Jim Serdahl, and I'd look at him, I could do that. You know, and mm-hmm. uh, I could do that. You know, so it was kind of a, it was kind of a knowing that I, that, that's where uh, my ta- talents laid. You know, um, you know, you're born with certain things, things you know you can do. You know, you, you can be an, you know, you can do whatever. You know, you you know you can do something. And, uh, and I knew I could do something like that. So yeah, it kind of fell into place. Talk about some of the changes that not in like personnel, but as far as technology goes from, from 1981 at Wavy to 2021 and how, you know, some things maybe are the same and in, in how you operate. Some things are different. Now, uh, in around 1980, I went to an American meteorological society convention in San Francisco. And at this convention, there was a meteorologist from a television station in Madison, Wisconsin. This man's name was Terry Kelly. And Terry Kelly and a guy from the University of Wisconsin had gotten together and invented something, some software, Mm -hmm. on an Apple II computer uh, that would display weather, that would display weather statistics and and, uh, display them on a map. It was very crude, it was very 8-bit, uh, very pixelated, and um, it was unique. And I went back to Nebraska, talked to the general manager, and I said, this is kind of interesting. And uh, would you be interested in this? And I, and I brought back a tape with it, uh, uh, with it on there, a three-quarter inch tape. So I, so I brought it back, and he looked at it and he said, yeah. He said, go up to Madison, Wisconsin, check it out, see what's going on with it. See what's going on with it, see, see if it's worth getting. So I went up to Madison, flew up to Madison, and had a look at it. And uh, the guy who, uh, Terry Kelly, the guy who worked as a meteorologist at this TV station, he, uh, he wasn't really big on sales or anything, and he was working. And he said, okay, well, and the, t- and the weather office was in a uh, kind of a loft on one, above the prop room, okay? So you had to climb these steep steps yeah. to get up to this loft above the prop room. And there he had this Apple II computer. And he said, well, he said, I'm going to dinner now. Go ahead and play around with it a little bit if you want. And uh, he said, you can't break anything. Uh, go ahead and play around with it a little bit if you want, and uh, we'll go from there. So I did, and kind of left on my own, left the TV station on my own, went back to my hotel, flew back to Nebraska the next morning. And I said, yeah, I said, I think it's pretty good. So anyway, the TV station that I worked for in Nebraska brought, bought serial number three, serial number number three, of that of that uh, uh, computer. Wow! And what it was, there was a cable outlet in Texas that bought it, and they just bought it to run constantly and display temperatures. 
so it didn't use a meteorologist with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and oh, the first one was, of course, WKOW in Madison, Wisconsin. Second one was a place in Texas. And so I was the first actual meteorologist to get into get into computer weather wow. other than the guy who invented it. Well, Terry Kelly and 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 this professor from uh, uh, from the University of Wisconsin Madison uh, went on to become multi millionaires because they invented this thing and and it was revolutionary and it kept growing and growing and growing and became something called Weather Central and uh, finally they got out of it about six seven years ago and they got bought out of it by basically IBM and now IBM has the main weather computer business and that's what we're that's what we're using at this tv station so when i got when i first got to wavy i for what it's worth i made them promise get me a weather computer Mm -hmm. we need to stop using these maps with plexiglass on top of them that you draw with a marker etc and that's what i used for perhaps and that was in place of a green screen like you would stand in front of a little literal map yeah well actually what i did too is i'd use a green screen i'd take uh so i would have uh would be able to use uh a lot more maps what i would do is i'd have maps printed up and displayed on a on an easel and the camera would shoot those on the easel and display them in a green screen. And then they'd cut away to something and then they'd replace the map with a, with another map. And mm. then so it'd be a green screen behind me, but I'd also have I'd also have plexiglass. It was all quite complicated and it required uh, and it required different sources for the director to use, different cameras. Uh, they'd also require a chiron. They'd require video behind things for example for current conditions so there was wow. uh, a lot of different TVs and you understand this I don't know if our viewers would but uh, you know you have different sources this is one these are two sources right now here uh, I'm a source of video you're a source of video but we would use like three or four different sources of video uh, for each uh, weathercast wow. so the director had to be on their toes uh, and listen to vi- to verbal cues from me calling for something. Uh, so we used that for a year, and then finally we ended up getting a, an updated version of a Weather Central computer, but it was still an Apple II uh, at the time. Floppy disks, uh, you know, just very crude. Uh, so that's what we used for, you know, a while, and we called it CompuWeather 10. Wow, and then graduated from there to a little bit better one that was, you know, sixteen bit, and then, and then finally, uh, finally better graphics. I had no idea you were the first meteorologist to use a weather computer like that. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of cool. I was actually second, uh, other than the guy yeah. who was the vendor. True. of the thing. That's still crazy. Yeah. So, um, let's talk about weather now. So, how has weather changed in, in Hampton Roads over the last 40 years? Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll talk, sort of give you a, a jump point. You talked about the newsroom would flood and we know, both of us know Portsmouth is very bad at flooding. So like things like that, like what have you noticed over the last 40 years that is, that have changed? Uh, certainly uh, global climate change has, has kicked in. Uh, for example, uh, the first time I ever saw in, uh, it was rather odd. Uh, first time I saw some flooding going on into southern sections of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. Uh, by Chesapeake, I mean uh, uh, down near the Blackwater River. Uh, or uh, 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 I can't remember the name of the park there. There's a park in, in southern, it's not the, that river. Uh, but there's a there's a river in Chesapeake uh, that used to use its water, uh, the, the water out of the river, as a source for water for its for its drinking supply, and uh, that became polluted with with uh, salt because of the fact that sea level was rising, and there would be more sea seawater coming into that. Uh, it's down at Northwest River Park. That's what it is, um, Northwest River. So that would become polluted with salt. I mean, that was odd. Well, this is because of a southerly wind and sea level rise. 
Also in the Pongo area, uh, we would see occasionally uh, persistent southeast or southerly wind uh, drive some water up into that part of the world. Well, it was uh, into southern Virginia Beach. Uh, now it's a regular occurrence. It used to happen. It was a rather odd, odd thing. It would happen maybe once every uh, four or five years. It was an oddity. Now it happens two, three times a year. So parts of Virginia Beach, southern Virginia Beach, uh, there are places there. Uh, for example, there's a restaurant there uh, that's had to move. Mm -hmm. uh, there are places which have had to build up higher now because of that, because of the uh, flooding that goes on more consistently into southern Virginia Beach. In terms of what we're seeing in terms of temperatures, uh, we aren't seeing a lot more record high temperatures uh, but we are seeing virtually no record low temperatures anymore. We don't see temperatures bottom out and really break records in the wintertime or the summertime. I think the last time we saw a record low temperature was about four or five years ago in July. Uh, temperature dropped one night to about 60 degrees, which was a new record. Mm -hmm. But we don't see record low temperatures, for example, uh, in the wintertime. We just don't anymore. Um, they've just stopped. Uh, temperatures don't get that cold at night anymore in the middle of the winter, whereas we would drop into the teens uh, and single digits. No, it doesn't happen anymore. So what? that's the that's been the biggest thing. That's been a gradual, gradual thing. And also, you just notice the weather patterns have changed. Uh, we see, for example, we uh, it's been cold. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, during the month of February, it's uh, kind of cold today. Um, uh, but the nighttime temperature doesn't drop, you know. So yeah. with that colder air, we can see snowstorms, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and we have seen them not so much this year. But in the past few years, we've seen some pretty good sized snowstorms, but we don't see, and that's because there's greater moisture in the air. Um, uh, but we don't see, um, uh, we just don't see record low temperatures anymore. We don't see the extreme cold anymore. Yeah, it's cold out during the day, but when you add up the entire months, it ends up being a little bit above average. Oh, really? You know, for the month of February, for example, everybody thought, yeah, it's been cold, and it was. It was cold and rainy a lot, um, but the actual temperature when you average it out over the entire month ended up being a little bit above average. Hmm. What about um, like for severe weather? Because you know I'm only I'm 26, so I've only been conscious of the weather for so long. But it seems like more recently, and not just in Hampton Roads, but the whole country, there's more tornadoes, and like all of Texas was frozen i mean is that is that just because i'm noticing it now or is it is that a real thing that's happening well it is it is um there are more extreme events uh it's not so much global warming it's global weirdness you end up with these w extreme weather events uh the texas <coughs> excuse me the texas event was actually not all that unusual it was unusual uh, but they'd had two other events and staggered by 10 years. Um, and and uh, Texas made a conscious effort uh, to keep themselves on their own power grid, and which uh, with, uh, because of political reasons, et cetera, and money reasons, mm -hmm. uh, because they're obviously heavy, heavily into uh, uh, petroleum. And they can afford to have their own power grid. But the thing about it is they didn't bury their pipelines. Uh, they didn't provide heaters to their pipelines. Uh, and even though they've got, um, even though they've got some wind power uh, and solar power, they did, uh, wind power especially, uh, they didn't protect those against extreme cold. So they ended up with a disaster on their hands that did not need to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the power shut down because they just wanted to avoid regulation and they just wanted to avoid the expense of protecting those. Uh, uh, the, the, they wanted to avoid the extra expense 
of protecting their infrastructure against extreme cold, which does not happen that often, right. but which does happen. Happens yeah. about once every 10 years. Yeah. So. Staying on um, severe weather, I know we're recording this in March. I'm probably going to release this April or May, but um, yesterday <laughs> we had tornado watches or warnings. Um, and obviously in coastal Virginia, we're not in tornado alley. So is that common or is that kind of a change? That has evolved over the years. It used to be that uh, we would see tornadoes from cold fronts, etc., a little bit farther inland. And then once they got close to the coastline, they were a lot more rare. Um, on average, into the Hampton Roads area, we would see under one tornado a year uh, in our viewing area. Uh, and now, well, we've already seen one uh, that happened last last night. And this is, we're taping this, what, March 19th, I guess it is, yeah. whatever it is. Um, uh, we saw one on March 18th. So yeah, that was early, uh, but not unusually so uh, with everything going on. But the thing about it is we are seeing more uh, tornadoes now. But the thing about that is we're, uh, we're also dealing with better equipment, uh, better better weather radars. Uh, the National Weather Service radar in uh, Wakefield is something that all the TV stations use mm -hmm. um, because it just has huge capabilities. It's a, a $2 million uh, radar that was put in a number of years ago, but it's extensible. In other words, it can be added on to the software can be added on to the, the equipment uh, can be improved uh, as can the software. So uh, with all of that, yes, we are seeing more tornadoes, but a lot of it is because we are seeing, uh, uh, we're seeing them better with radar. Uh, so we're seeing them uh, more often. So where tornadoes in years past uh, might have been there mm -hmm. and hit an unpopulated area, I got you know, you. been out over open country uh, and and uh, didn't do any damage or anything, uh, but the but they were there. They're now being reported, and now and now, uh, so we're getting a better idea that there, yes, there are more tornadoes uh, going on than we had thought, but there are probably more tornadoes as a result of the climate change as well. That makes total sense. Um, okay, so severe weather, but talking about being on air, I know one thing that, that people either love or hate you for, and all the meteorologists, is covering a show. So talk about the importance of that and, and why sometimes it's, it's best to let you guys do your thing. Well, but yeah, what we try to do, we have, a, we have kind of a gauged response. Um, uh, if, it, if it is a severe thunderstorm warning capable, and, it's, it, and what we relate to is what's going on in terms of uh, how many people are affected by it. Uh, if we have severe thunderstorms that are bearing down uh, on the Hampton Road cities, let's say Virginia Beach itself, uh, Virginia Beach is the most popular city in the state. If we have life endangering, property endangering thunderstorms bearing down on the city of Virginia Beach, we kind of cut loose and want to protect everybody. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is going, whoa, that looks bad, let's flip on and see what's going on, they, then we're there, okay? Uh, if we have a, let's say, a uh, lone severe thunderstorm in a rural area, uh, what we try to do is break in, do a two minute little thing during what's, uh, what is a network break. In other words, let's say we're in prime time. Uh, TV shows are running, you know, what, whatever TV show is running, we will steal a network commu commercial break. So we don't interrupt programming, cover what's going on. We want to cover everybody, uh, but we have to kind of do things proportionally if we can. Mm -hmm. And certainly the crawl across the bottom of your screen, which is kind of annoying, uh, but that, but that covers us as well. Uh, we are required by the way, by the FCC, uh, when there is life endangering weather out there to go on the air. Okay. So to keep our license, we have to break in with audio and video to let people know what's going on. It is a requirement of the FCC. 
Uh, so we can't just ignore something saying, no, nah, you know. Uh, so that's one thing going on. But we do it proportionally. Right. If Virginia Beach is being threatened uh, with life endangering, property endangering uh, kinds of things, uh, we'll stay on the air. Uh, for example, for a major uh, metropolitan area, it depends on the number of lives being affected uh, as to as to how much coverage we get. It. It's just got to do it proportionally. But I also take into account, you know, if it's the finale of something, yeah. you know, if the season finale, I'll cut in during the commercial break, take over a commercial break, uh, and let you get through your finale, and then. And then uh, come back later when it's not the finale, and and blow it out a little bit more, uh, give it greater coverage. So we're very well aware of it, uh, but we try and do it proportionally uh, if if we can. What has been the-, it, the the thing about it is too, uh, yeah. But it isn't for me. It isn't over my house. We can't. We don't have the ability, and neither does the internet to target exactly at your house Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what goes out. We can't just do your TV set or your neighborhood and and say, no, you don't have any problems here. You have, you know, here, you keep running your TV show. We don't have that ability. Neither does the internet or anything to be able to target just your house. Uh, uh, So we got to, if there's a tornado bearing down on somewhere, we got to hit everybody. And if there's a tornado bearing on down on your house, you would want us there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we've got to do that, but we try and do it proportionally. Kind of on a lighter note with the same thing. What has been like the, the biggest event? Cause I know you said you're, you're conscious of what show is on. What's been the biggest thing that you've had to blow out and people have been really bummed on. Oh, God, I don't know. I don't remember. Really. People love their days of their days of our lives. I know that's a big one that people don't like to uh, cover up. <laughs> well, yeah, people love their days of our lives, but at the same time, gotta love their lives. I'm sorry. They have to love their own lives too. Uh, yes, and and when you're talking about proportionally, there actually aren't a lot of people watching it. Really? Days of our lives. Uh, there really aren't a lot of people watching it. So, yes, very devoted fans. And when Days of Our Lives gets blown out, we will repeat it at some point. You know, we'll, we'll uh, repeat it and, and, uh, uh, and uh, let, let those soap fans have their Days of Our Lives. Um, um, you know, so it doesn't get a huge audience, actually. <laughs> so a vocal audience and a dedicated audience and by golly if we have to if we have to cut into days of our lives we're going to play it back you know <laughs> yeah. so but but i can remember too uh during uh the the one during uh something in the water um uh, we had a huge line of thunderstorms hits uh virginia beach mm-hmm. and people were waiting for example at the amphitheater uh, to board buses, uh, to head to the ocean front. And we had reporters out there and, you know, we got on the air, stayed on the air and, and tried to warn people about it saying, Hey, you cannot be caught out in the open, uh, with this. And people were out in the open, you know, and we, and I remember a reporter, we had, uh, uh, Chris Horn was our reporter there. And I remember telling Chris Horn on the air, talk to the police, tell them to get the people back in their cars, get them to safety, uh, wow. get out of the, get out of the outdoors. Uh, so there is a genuine, genuine public service uh, factor involved here. And that's, that's what we keep at top of mind. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I talk about proportional, but that, but if there, if there is a genuine threat to public safety, uh, we're on it. And, and that is our top concern, not what's on the air, not what shows were blown out. Rightfully, yeah. Uh, if, the, if people's lives are being in danger, that is what's on our mind. Yeah. So what is, um, what's the biggest or most memorable weather event, whether it be flooding, hurricane, tornado that you have covered? Probably Isabel. Um, 
that was an all day event. Um, water started coming, the wind started coming up in right away in the morning. Uh, and the water started coming up. The tidal flooding started coming up right away in the morning and it just stayed all day long. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we had, so we had winds of 50 miles an hour gusting to 75 all day Jeez. long, uh, over 75. We had lots of winds gusting to 90. And I can remember that there were, uh, you know, lots of people were tra trapped in their homes, no electricity, trees falling down all over the place, onto houses, onto, uh, onto cars, onto certainly electric lines. And prior to that event, we had had a minor encounter with, a, with I forget what, what storm it was, but it had produced a lot of heavy rain. Um, and so the ground was just soaked. It was just soggy. <coughs> Excuse me. And while Isabel did not produce a lot of rain, it had a lot of wind. So there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of trees that were just kind of standing in muck. Um, and those trees fully leafed out, uh, full of leaves, full of leaves, and they just came tumbling on down. Mm all over the place. We lost tens of thousands of trees uh, to that event. And we lost, um, uh, you know, lots and lots of them. I didn't have power at my house for uh, 10 days, two weeks, something like that. And, you know, everybody at first, all the neighbors, you know, afterwards, the after effects of it were, you know, just people living without power. And I can remember at first, everybody was, oh, we'll do a neighborhood barbecue. You know, that kind of thing. Well, we all got tired of that in a while. <laughs> uh, you know, and and ice became the uh, more valuable than gold because you could store away uh, something out of the grocery stores. The grocery stores would have emergency generators and eventually power. Um, and uh, some grocery stores uh, uh, would have semis full of ice that they would just dole out ice to. Um, you know, so I, but uh, that storm, Isabel was the big one, and it lasted all day long. And at the TV station, uh, uh, the physical, we are in everyone's home. It doesn't matter where we are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if we were wherever, out in the country, in Virginia Beach or in the peninsula, or wherever we are. We are in everybody's home. So it doesn't matter where the physical location of the TV station is that much. Uh, we are in everyone's home. That's what counts. Um, but the TV station is located in Portsmouth, and it's close to the water, and it's close to the amphitheater, and the water came up. And the water came up to the very edge of getting into the TV station where there are cable pits running through the floors, mm -hmm. the concrete floors. And you know this. There are these, there's corrugated metal on top of it, uh, and, but you can pull those up and those cable pits run uh, throughout the building, uh, connecting the studio with the control rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And if the water had come up two inches more or an inch even more, it would have flooded the TV station and it shot us down. Wow. Uh, because it would have been an electrical danger. We would have had to have just pulled, you know, just pulled the uh, plug on the TV station, shutting it down. Uh, so we were within an inch of that all day long. Uh, um, so, you know, when I wasn't on the air, which was not very often, I was on the air pretty much nonstop. Uh, we, you know, I'd walk out and look to see if the water, you could tell by the water, water line on the curb, uh, as to whether, as to whether the water had come up or come down at all. And it just stayed at the same level all day long. I could also see across a lot where my car was, uh, whether that was still above water. Um, so, uh, so you know, watch that all day long. Of course, the amphitheater uh, across the way, you know, across the parking lot, maybe a block away, that got ripped to shreds uh, in that. So, um, yeah, it was quite the event. Uh, in terms of wind, especially. I probably should know this, but when there's an event like that, 
Do we partner with radio stations? Because if you lose power, you lose <coughs> your TV. Yeah, th yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, actually, because we did. Uh, management at that time made the very, and, and I knew about it too, made the very wise decision to partner with radio stations. And it was very strange because I was still dealing with video saying, oh, here's the radar, here's where things are. Mm -hmm. Here's where the center of the storm is. Here's where Isabel is, the center of Isabel. Uh, and it's now moving uh, just to the southwest of Franklin. Uh, you know, so I'd have to actually uh, kind of paint pictures with words for people up who were listening on the radio. And at that point, the vast majority of people were listening on the radio uh, because of the fact that uh, because of the fact that they didn't have power, they couldn't get TV. Hmm. Most people couldn't. Okay, so let's use that as a segue into technology of today, and like people can get the weather on their phone. So why should they watch TV versus look at it on their phone? And I know Wavy has the weather app, but yeah, um, because you're going to get something that is. Uh, that is curated by someone, mm -hmm. by a person, uh, and a person who knows the area, who knows the geography, the topography, uh, knows the area in terms of where places flood, who knows what people do for a living, uh, who knows where the busy roads are who knows where things are in terms of what people are doing, who knows what time it is in terms of are the kids getting off school? It's obviously not relatable right now yeah. uh, as much, but it will be. Um, what time are kids getting off school? That kind of thing. Who knows what people are doing? So it's curated and controlled by that, whereas apps uh, and other things are just so general. You know, they'll say 20, a 30% chance of rain. What does that mean? Who? gets the rain. I will say, well, in the toward the Virginia, North Carolina border, we're expected to see some rain. The rest of us, no, nah, probably not, you know, but that'll show up as a 30% chance of rain for everyone on one of these apps. Okay. So we're able to show you what's going on as opposed to these apps, which are very uh, dumb computer driven. Talk about the percent chance of rain, because I just recently learned from, I think it was a, it was on TikTok, and then I asked um, our colleague Jeff Edmondson and Casey Leheka, I thought the percent chance was like 30 out of 100 days with similar conditions, but they said it's more of coverage area. Yeah, it is. It's for a, it's for a, a, a zone area, and that's why, I, uh, that's why I try to pin it down to uh, uh, some kind of wording mm -hmm. instead of that 30% chance. And I just did that, for example. Yeah, there's 30% chance. Uh, we'll see a few pop-up showers in the afternoon, but they'll be down here or up here. Right. Uh, so mo you people probably won't see a thing. Uh, you people, yeah, you might see a few showers, but it's not going to last all day. You know, so you deal with that kind of thing instead of that 30% probability. But that probability means something. See a 90% chance of rain for your area, it's going to rain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 30%, eh, probably not. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I had another question I forgot. Oh, okay, so I remember. All right. So forecasting. I know the thing nowadays is the seven-day. But how far out? Because it changes a lot. So is it yeah. to be taken with a grain of salt? <clears throat> yeah, once you get toward five, days five, six, seven, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but sometimes, sometimes those are pretty good. If we see, you know, if there's really, really a changeable uh, pattern for the northern hemisphere, I mean, that's, we're talking, you know, we're talking really the northern hemisphere. We're talking all the way back to, uh, Siberia, uh, look at what's going on today in Siberia for what might have be happening here seven days from now. But if it's relatively quiet and stable uh, all the way back to Siberia, well, then, yeah, the seven days are probably pretty accurate. Uh, but then when things are more in flux and changeable way up the line, 
weather moves from west to east in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so if things in northern Europe and Siberia are, are relatively stable and nothing much going on, yeah, you know, uh, for seven days out, it's actually not a bad forecast. Uh, but if things are very changeable and the weather pattern uh, is very changeable for the northern hemisphere, uh, then five, six, seven days out, eh, there could be some things wrong with the forecast. Uh, plus, uh, for example, right now, to, they're, they're kind of changeable, and we're seeing the occasional storm move by. Well, is that storm five, six, seven days from now, is it going to be up by D.C.? Or is it going to be in South Carolina? Big difference in what mm -hmm. happens with our weather. Because if it's in D.C., we get warm weather, and it probably isn't that bad. If it's in South Carolina or North Carolina or over the top of us, uh, then we get different uh, different situation. And that's a pretty small avenue when you're talking seven days out for it to hit somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. Well, uh, somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, you know, you're talking basically from Philly uh, southward to Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. you know? So what do you do? Uh, so you say, well, something's going to happen then. You know? This is a dumb question probably, but that's the point of this show. So you said weather moves from west to east. And I've always wondered this, what causes wind? Is it the turning of the earth or is it the? Partially. Okay. So I'm not totally it, it stupid. Is. Yeah. It's partial. It's part, it has a great deal to do with it. Uh, but it's also uneven heating uh, on a global basis and on a local basis. Um, une by uneven heating, I mean that, for example, that the Coriolis force is part of the whole spin of the earth and, and, and how it spins off uh, high, low pressure, especially. Um, and I'm not going to get into it, but, but basically it's that. Um, the Coriolis force is, is uh, control spins on the earth. Um, but also uneven heating. When you think of uneven even heating, uh, it's, as, it's as localized as stepping from a light colored uh, concrete sidewalk mm -hmm. to a piece of asphalt with bare feet. Think about that, okay? A one, one thing you can walk on, the other one with bare feet, no, you're, it's hot. Yeah. Uh, so that's uneven heating. There are darker areas on the earth and locally and micro, uh, micro locally, uh, just stepping from a sidewalk to the asphalt with bare feet. Uh, and there are larger areas like that on the earth. For example, snow covered areas. What this relates to is, is uh, basically uh, the reflectivity of the earth. So if you have sunlight that's coming on in and it hits snow, that sunlight bounces off the snow because it's reflective and and that reflects back into outer space and you don't retain as much heat but if there's a darker colored area of the earth uh it holds on to that heat mm -hmm. okay so what you end up with is darker colored areas of the earth end up holding on to more heat and 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 it reflects back north you know it reflect it goes up heat rises uh, and then with uh, areas of the earth that are cooler, air descends. So you end up with this spin. Look, I'm trying to do it here. <laughs> it spins. Yeah. But with that spin, it can, it can create some horizontal, it creates horizontal spin as well. So you end up with the oceans, for example. They, end up, they have a pretty constant temperature. Water temperature doesn't, doesn't change very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, So... For example, in the Atlantic, where we are, water temperature drops to as low as around 38 and stays there, 38, 40, 42 degrees. Uh, and we've come out of that now. We're on the rise a little bit. But it takes a long time for that water to warm up, okay? And then once that water is warm, uh, it warms up to around 80. Uh, and lately, it's been a little higher than that, which is not good. Uh but it warms up to around 80. So you go out into the 
go out swimming or surfing uh, in July, late July or August, mm-hmm. as like bath water uh, in the ocean. So you have a constant temperature there, but let's say it's cold. Let's say that water temperature is cold, but the land heats up and cools down every day. So a simple analogy to that is a sea breeze. Let's say you have a spring day, Mm -hmm. an April or May day, where the temperature heats up to 90 degrees, okay? I'm trying to do it in front of you here on the table. (laughs) Uh, What happens is that you end up with a sea breeze and the land heats up to 90 degrees, okay? So the air starts rising over the land, but over the ocean it's sinking. So you end up with that circulation that I talked about, yeah. that horizontal roll, and so that will roll on inland a bit, okay? So it'll roll inland, and you end up with a sea breeze. And that sea breeze, as it rolls inland, that rolling tube of air rolls inland, it can create lift where that warm 90-degree air with lots of humidity in it, that starts rising with that tube. It kicks up the air into a rising little line of thunderstorms. Hmm. Well, that goes on on a global basis as well. So you end up with areas with differential heating. And uh, so you end up with a warmer area, a warm mass, and then a cold mass meets it, a cold front meets it. The same thing happens. You end up with rising air up ahead of it. With that rising air, you end up with a lot more water vapor in that air. There's more water vapor. Uh, warmer air can hold more water vapor. Colder air cannot. It is naturally drier. So that warmer air uh, holding water is forced to rise. And once that air rises, it gets into cooler air aloft, and that creates clouds and eventually thunderstorms. Uh, and so you end up with a lines of thunderstorms, for example, along a cold front or out ahead of a cold front. That is crazy. It is crazy how so the world works. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's differential heating is, is part of it, but it's driven along as well by the Coriolis force, the spin of the earth. That Okay, you are definitely way smarter than me. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. It's, it's really pretty easy. Well. That, that, however, uh, however, the uh, science behind it is tough. I mean, you have... Uh, uh, you have to learn, uh, you know, some really, there's trig involved in lots of stuff uh, in terms of and gas laws and, and all kinds of things going on and fluid dynamics, lots of things going on behind it. We're closing in on an hour and I don't want to keep you too much longer, but we'll, let's talk about what you do on a typical work day. When you come in, how do you, what do you do to prepare for your shows? In, it depends. Um, on a day like, uh, and again, we're taping this, but a, but a day like yesterday um, was a busy day with thunderstorms. So I was in early. I was in about an hour early. And people were in there before I was because they were there for the, for the earlier shifts. So first thing I do is speak with them, see what's going on, um, and uh, see what's going on. And plus, I've looked at it before I've come in. I've, I've looked at what's going on. Uh, with the models, et cetera, and what the radar is doing by that point and what the thinking is uh, prior to that point. And I see how things are going on. Is it behaving with it, you know, with itself? Are the models correct or not correct? Because sometimes they can be off, and yesterday they were. They were a little bit off, but a little on as well in terms of what was going on. Um, so I'll go in early uh, and really hunker down and see what's going on with everything and, and uh, focus in on that. But other days, there are days um, uh, when we're ta- while we're taping this, there's probably going to be a tiny bit of snow that's not going to do anything, but it's going to do things. It's doing things in Williamsburg right now. For example, a little bit of snow is mixed in with some rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but by the time I get in for the evening newscast, it's all going to be gone. You know, so I don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and it's not going to do anything anyway, but the wind is going to be up. I know that the wind is going to be up and then the tides are going to be up. So I know that that's coming. So um, so I'll focus in on that right away when I get in. And I'm um, over the top of computers putting together, uh, putting together what's going on in terms of graphics and in terms of the forecast. 
one thing that I don't think people realize is that you guys, I mean, while there is a bit of preparation with the numbers and everything, you guys are, are up there freestyling where the, the anchors have their scripts. Yeah. How, yeah. It is totally ad lib. Uh, but we are putting together the graphics, so they are leading us on. We've put right. together, hopefully, a recognizable to you a story from beginning to end of, of uh, what we're doing and what's going on. And, uh, for example, we'll put visual cues for ourselves, for the viewer and for ourselves, uh, to remember to mention this. Um, uh, for example, tonight I'll, I, there will be visual cues. Uh, because we've had strong northeasterly winds, and we're going to end up with a, some minor uh, tidal flooding. It won't be real, real big, but it will affect some lots. Uh, uh, you know, some neighborhoods, that kind of thing, S some street flooding because of tides and not because of rain. Uh, but there will be visual cues for me to do that. In closing, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about the future of <coughs> weather itself. Let's talk about the future of... Um, you know, where technology is headed. And let's talk about the future of Don Slater. Um, uh, future of weather itself. That's, that's something that we're really, really going to have to deal with. Um, and it can be a very, very uh, important thing in terms of rejiggering our economy and our, and our way of life, but in a profitable way not only in terms of money uh, and jobs, but uh, also in terms of, in terms of really ensuring uh, that uh, our, our way of life continues, you know, but in a different way. So um, we need to convert to uh, non-petroleum uh, uh, and uh, uh, non-fossil fuels because but the fossil fuel side, the, the, the carbons, I'm going to go over this real, real quickly. Okay. Uh, there are cycles of water, okay? Water falls, falls, uh, rain falls, goes into streams, goes into the oceans, and then it comes back up, and then it recirculates, okay? And it's all done within a relatively short time, time frame. Sometimes it's longer, but basically it's moving around. Carbon, on the other hand, that's, that's another uh, cycle. Uh, carbon, on the other hand, we've upset the carbon cycle greatly. There's a thin layer of carbon dioxide uh, over the top of the earth. And it takes, and when, when sunlight comes in, it comes out and it goes out, okay? It's supposed to. But it is also trapped a little bit by that carbon dioxide, that layer of carbon dioxide, uh, uh, the greenhouse effect. A little bit of it is trapped and held in, keeps the earth warm, mm -hmm. okay? Nice. Well, we've added way too much carbon to that carbon uh, to the uh, uh, carbon dioxide layer, and so that greenhouse effect is exaggerated now. Too much heat is staying in. The sunlight comes in, heat, but it's staying in now. Okay, because of the fact that carbon normally in its cycle takes thousands and millions of years from a dead, a dying plant or animal or us carbon-based life forms sink into the earth and stay there for thousands or millions of years. We're pulling petroleum and coal out of the earth, and that is carbon, and it's huge amounts of carbon dioxide uh, is going into the atmosphere. So we got to figure out how to uh, knock that down so we aren't using uh, carbon-based fuels. And, and go to renewable sources of energy uh, and somehow get, get the planet back to what it should be where it's regulating itself uh, because we can't change that. We, we can't change, we, we've changed it. Uh, we've changed it badly. Uh, we need to let the planet take care of itself. Uh, and to do that, we need to uh, go to renewable fuels for your future. Uh, more, uh, you're younger than I am. Um, Barely. And what was it? And that, what was it? And so we need to take care of that. That's in terms of what, uh, the, uh, what's going on. What was the other questions? The future of the technology and, and forecasting, and then the future yeah, of Don future Slater. Future technology and forecast. Forecasting is in flux. It's improving greatly on the one hand. However, weather patterns are changing uh, because of climate change. And uh, so lots of rules do not apply in terms of what goes on every spring or every summer or every winter. 
Uh, in terms of the technology, um, I see that continuing um, to improve in terms of forecasting technology. In terms of how it gets to the end user, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I just don't know how things are going to evolve, uh, how things are going to be evolving to where it gets to average person sitting at home. What's my forecast? Will it evolve to a point where that forecast is so micro pl um, placed right at somebody's house? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. We're probably working toward. Um, in term, uh, what was the rest of it? The future of Don Slater. Forty years is a long time. Are you riding? You know. go until the wheels uh, fall off. I'm sorry. Are you go until the wheels fall off. Um, I, I'm kind of slowing down in terms of uh, the number of uh, in terms of the weather cast that I'm doing. So I'm kind of working myself into a semi-retirement. Um, I don't know why I'm only. 39 right now, but um, it happens to all of us. It too shall happen to you. And, um, I still have the same head on my shoulder, same brain, um, uh, but you do get older and um, you kind of, um, so I'm kind of working my way into semi-retirement. We'll see. Well, that's exciting. And congrats for that. Cause well, it's, it's exciting, but it's not exciting as well. And it's kind of nice to be not excited with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that in your specific career is that the weather will never go away. So even when you're retired, it'll still be raining and snowing and all that outside. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll get a handle on, on climate change uh, and really, really start to, uh, and again, it could be very profitable. Think of the factories we could make. Uh, making wind power and, and making solar power and uh, using other sources. You, you can use a lot of sources. You can use, uh, uh, for example, parts of Greenland for, or, uh, uh, yeah, Greenland or Iceland uh, uses, uh, uses geothermal. Uh, parts of the West Coast could use geothermal. Certainly Hawaii could use geothermal. Um, and uh, also wave power. Uh, you can use tides and waves to generate electricity and uh, find ways to make all of it work. Well, the future is hopefully bright in, in those yes. ways. And uh, thank you again for, for taking the time. When I was trying to do a little bit of research on you, I didn't find a whole lot on the internet. So I think I'm one of probably few that have had the chance to talk to you on this candid level. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you. I don't see you that much anymore. You used to work in the in nights and now you're working in the mornings. So. Yeah, yeah, now it's... We're on the opposite ends of the earth. It's nicer at night. Yeah. You get to hang out. You get to sleep in, too. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot what that's like. I All can't right. do that anymore. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Stephen. You too. Thanks. Thanks.